HBS Club of New York for inviting BLR to be here. Um, so I wanted to show you what uh, Bellevue Literary Review, BLR, is a literary journal, an actual book with pages that smell wonderful and you can hold in your hand. Um, but it also comes digitally and we've been publishing poetry, fiction, and nonfiction that relate to health, illness, and healing um, since 2001. And we're now an independent uh, nonprofit literary arts organization. And we're uh, very excited to share what we're doing with, uh, with you. Um, and I'm so pleased that I'm being joined by my co-editor, Abba Belgrave, who is a, one of our poetry editors who's here tonight, uh, as well as Sharon Preddy, one of our poets, and Samuel Ottman, who had a nonfiction piece recently. Um, so I thought I would start by asking everyone, and maybe Abba, you'll, you'll start us off with kind of how you got into this area that really sort of overlaps uh, art and creativity and healing and writing and what you do now with it. Um, thank you, Danielle. Happy to be here. Thank you for Sharon and, and Samuel for joining us. Um, how did I get here? I, um, my own process, I've been a writer my entire life, apparently tells me. And I, I came to this by writing through my own cancer experience, breast cancer, um, and being a poet and using poetry to really make sense of a very terrifying time. And, and basically I think of art and poetry as something that can be healing and can be very therapeutic um, as for, for me as a writer. And I think that that's you know, how I got here and why I'm on your team and basically what I love about what we do. Um, and I'd like to introduce Sharon Freddy next and ask her to talk about how she came to us. Hey everyone, thanks so much for inviting me here today. I'm really excited to be here and honored to be part of this panel. So my, my connection with art and healing um, is both a personal and a professional one. Um, I, I, as a poet, I write about many topics, but in the last several years, a central focus has been um, my writing about the illness and uh, death of my oldest brother, uh, Brian, from pancreatic cancer. And it certainly wasn't something I was planning to write about. It, it really did just start to happen and then became this emotional map month after month, poem after poem as a way to translate something that felt so untranslatable. And it's really only, only in retrospect that I could say it gave that process, the actual writing process gave me a way to have this sense of integration emotionally, uh, spiritually during this time of great disintegration. Um, and then professionally, um, I am a social worker at Laguna Honda Hospital, which is a very large um, nursing home rehab facility in San Francisco. And I've been there since 1994. And in 1996, I was able to start a poetry writing group for the patients there. And ever since that first group, I have been moved and astonished by what can happen when you put pen paper and a writing topic in a patient's hands. Um, so I've been very privileged to hear the stories, to hear what people have been through and to learn about the patients, every single group. Um, and I've really watched their, them be able to tap into their own wholeness, their own vitality that really exists inside them, you know, regardless of what their circumstances are. And the patients there come with so many different issues, substance abuse, mental illness, homelessness, uh, but they're all facing a physical challenge that has radically changed their lives. Sharon, I'm so glad you brought up Laguna Honda. If people don't know Laguna Honda, you know, I, I work at Bellevue, which is a, a city hospital in New York, and we think of Laguna Honda as a bit of our, um, our doppelganger uh, in the long-term care uh, re, uh, uh, area on the West Coast. And there's a wonderful book by Victoria Sweet uh, called God's Hotel mm -hmm. that tells the story of Laguna Honda Hospital. And, and uh, it's really a powerful book. And I was so moved by it. Um, and about the people and about the stories. And I, and I feel, I think, as you were saying, that telling the stories is something that we don't really have a chance to do sometimes in, in, in healthcare. You know, we write a chart, we, we write the patient's illness, but we don't often get the, the story. And I remember in the book, she talks about the head nurse who crochets um, a blanket for every patient. This older nurse, she's been there forever, and um, it's not very efficient. 
Um, and and uh, some years in, the efficiency experts discover the hospital, and they have some kind of Price Waterhouse Cooper consulting firm come in and make the place yeah. efficient. Of course, they fire the nurse who crochets the blankets because it's not very efficient. But in the end, all the patients start getting readmitted, and and you know, so it's interesting how we define efficiency. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just said the note about Dr. Sweet. Um, I, I was there. You know, we we worked together uh, for many, many, many years, and she was a big, big fan of the poetry group. She would refer patients to me. Um, she used to make sure uh, I would put out a chapbook every year of the patient's poem. She'd make sure she had a copy to send to her mother in Southern California. So she was a big proponent of whatever arts we could bring into the hospital. Absolutely. Um, so Samuel, I think we'll turn over to you. So tell us how you kind of got to where you are, what you do for your day job and how you got into writing. Thank you again for this invitation. My name is Samuel Altman. I'm an associate professor of English at DePaul University. And in my previous life, I was a newspaper writer. And so every few years, I would get to write an opinion piece or column. And I was, my parents divorced when I was young. So my father reappeared one day. And so I wrote a column that ran on the front page. And back then to have a column on the front page was like having something on Facebook for the whole world to see. And it, it really changed my relationship to that town and to those readers. And so every few years at all my papers, I got to write. So when my father passed away, I wrote another one. And I found that personal narrative was healing for me in that it sort of removed the shame of things that happened in my family and readers connected to it as well. And so I kept writing these and I realized, you know what, I think I'm probably an essayist. I think I'm probably not a reporter. And so I left newspapers and evolved into writing personal essays. And so this piece about my sister's schizophrenia had been in the works for like 15 years. I've been rewriting it and rewriting it and rewriting it and rewriting. And I said, you know, I know there's something good here. I'm just gonna keep doing it. And so I'm so grateful that Danielle and the editors at, I think it took psychiatrists to help me get this piece together because I realized in, in writing about mental illness, it was bigger than I could grasp and so so uh this piece ran and unfortunately it's online anyone who wants to see it it's called our eyes were watching marcia it's about my family's obsession with television and i uh, you know and my because i teach personal essays i have a lot, a lot of students come and one in one class i had it was me and 10 young women and they wrote about their lives and i and they i think they decided we're going to pretend he's not a man and they wrote about things I should not have heard. And, <laughs> and so, but, I, but I felt so moved and people were crying sometimes. And, and I have to remind students, I say, you know, this can be therapeutic, but this is not therapy. And so if you need to go get therapy, that's different. So I, so I do this sort of fancy dancing with my students to make sure that, you know, if you really need therapy, then by all means, get it. This can be helpful and help you contextualize your story and all that, but it's not therapy. So I really have to dance that line because I find in my nonfiction classes, people have no place else to talk about things. So they come and they bring me armloads of stories. People have run out of the classroom in tears talking about dead grandmothers. So I've, I've had to really, so I, so I know that there's a healing bomb in storytelling and I experience it all the time. So yeah, I, I think that's where I think I'll, that's where I'll stop. And maybe you can start us off by reading an excerpt from from our eyes were Mar watching Marsha and, and you know uh, Samuel's reference to a psychiatrist. Our nonfiction editor B L R Damon Tweedy is a psychiatrist, um, also author of an incredible book called Black Man in a White Coat, which I highly recommend. And so he uh, plucked Samuel's essay out of the slush pile, as we call it, and said, "This you know this piece is really worth it. Let's uh, let's work on it." So it was a it was a team effort. Um, so. Please, Samuel, go ahead and read a, a short excerpt of this wonderful piece. Thank you. It's called Our Eyes Were Watching Marsha. And Marsha refers to Marsha Brady from the Brady Bunch. OK, this is the very opening. Mama had just parked her Buick Regal in front of our red brick house. Even the row houses of North St. Louis sparkled in the warm spring sun. My sister, Chung, and I, both in our mid to late teens, carried the grocery bags up the steps of the front porch while mama retrieved the mail. The keys rattled as I unlocked the front door and we filed into the kitchen. Mama glancing at her at the bills and coupon flyers. As I reached for the light switch, I heard a rustling that rapidly crescendoed. Before I knew it, Chung had grabbed mama by her hair 
and slammed her head against the yellow kitchen wall. You bitch, Chung screamed at Mama. I'm gonna kill you. I hesitated for a moment, stunned, my grocery bag spilling onto the floor. Then I leapt at Chung, grabbed her by the roots of her jerry curl. Let her go, you bitch, I yell, or I'm gonna pull your fucking hair out. Raised in a Baptist household that frowned on profanity, I had never cursed in front of my mother. Get off me, Anthony, my sister shrieked. She always called me by my middle name, but I held on tight. Mama's brother, Eddie, had brought home beautiful pictures of a Korean woman he dated while he was stationed in Korea. Her surname was Chung. Once I heard that name, Mama said years later, I decided if I had a daughter, I'd call her that. That's how a black girl from St. Louis got an Asian name. Chung finally let Mama go, ran upstairs and slammed her bedroom door. It was a signature Marsha Brady mood. Even in our family's most disastrous moments of dealing with Chung's mental illness, TV was never far away from our consciousness. In 1985, the Brady Bunch had been off the air for a decade, but my sister watched the reruns religiously. Marsha Brady was her heroine. TV had always been a perfect distraction from our family's drama and trauma, soothing us more than our Baptist faith. TV was ubiquitous and extremely effective at programming us. Back in the 1970s and 80s, network television offered us kids from backgrounds deemed as marginalized, aspirational, unattainable families, but they look nothing like ours. I'll stop there. Thanks, Samuel. Um, Abba, can I pass it over to you? Oh, thank you. Thank you for that, Samuel. I'm going to read a couple of poems that were published when I was a contributor to BLR before I was an editor. The first poem is called Fumato Cancer Center. I meet a Jamaican at check-in. He hears British Trini Yardy in my soft tones and I concede to all three. He looks right at me, asks all the questions, then compliments my natural hair sees the Venezuelan from my father's side, something in your eyes, child. And I forget for a full 15 minutes where and who I am about to be, sitting across from this island born, who boasts knowing the best Trini Chinese shop on Nostrand. I have to write it down, and I have to go this weekend. Yes, nothing is guaranteed. And he's so right, I still remember his name these two months later, no closer to knowing what my body's been about, but thinking of him and how he hadn't been home in a minute. Amazed I wasn't crying, lucky to have been only three years past, if only for a funeral. And Chris, his name is Christopher, giving me good food, something to look forward to. If I die at 35, there will be no burial. Burn the body cancer cratered, toss the gray ash to a sea my kin crossed, unwilling and still I'm here. Wow. Um, I have to say, I remember when those poems uh, came through um, and they were stunning. Uh, we actually had them featured at one of our readings. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had a, a fall reading with actors who would uh, read BLR poetry and prose um, you know, from the stage. And that was one of the poems we chose because of, of its power. And when you see it on the page, and it is on our website at blreview.org, um, there's also power in the form and the structure of the poem that really uh, is, is incredible. Um, Sharon, why don't you tell us about your uh, poem and read it for us? So the first poem I'll read comes from my work experience. In the last couple of years, I've worked on the uh, dementia unit at Laguna Honda, and it serves uh, people who have pretty advanced dementia. Um, they can still walk around and talk, but the short-term memory is very, very poor. I particularly love this unit because when you walk through the doors, um, you can only be in the present moment because that's exactly where the, the patients are. So this poem was written after um, one of our new ladies came in and I was trying to interview her and just helping her get settled in. Well, inside the Alzheimer's unit. She flutters a translation of hands through her sleeves, the thinnest wind, Cloud shapes taped to the windows. Once she could read each tree, its angle and pitch, a branch's taper towards endpoint. 
everywhere, she says, Chopin asleep in her fingers. I'm from everywhere. This afternoon strung with paper cranes, anonymous leaves, carmine and purple and gold tipped into her cup at two o'clock refreshment. I'm still being born, she tells me, Hartford grainy, irretrievable. Down the hallway, we walk, arms in a braid. She's new here, the sapphire sky, seed small and remote, the date inked across a whiteboard. We walk everywhere, a bird in its shadow, her socks slow, exiled to her ankles. Second poem. This is one of the poems I, in a kind of long series of poems I wrote um, about my brother. And this one was written after his death. And it coincided with a time in California when we were having terrible, terrible fires in Northern California. So about several hundred miles from the San Francisco Bay area and the uh, town of Paradise burned down. Um, such a bad fire, all this, the smoke, the ash, you know, found its way to the skies above, or above San Francisco. When fire arrives. It's all wrong, today's sun, a welt in the fire smoke sky. Miles away into the east, paradise town is burning. The perfect measure of heat plus wind to gut the white pines, the classroom windows, to raise every armchair and saucer, the light poles, the ball hoops, a pickup's bulk. It's all wrong the way we're asked to sustain the worst. What I breathe burns, the inside air, memory, months, and I still snap out of sleep, sweat flushed, remembering my brother is dead. Stage four spread through flesh, then bone, then breath. All wrong, the ash dusking my backyard leaves. I see shapes in the smoke, a cow's wild eye, a woman screaming her son's awake. Never in my wildest dreams was what my brother said, astonished, as if he couldn't conceive of what came next a blowing away of have, of keep, of solid. This far from paradise, I imagine the aftermath mapped across their faces, mouths all gape and stun. Indoors for days, the sky without change. I want what they want, to be allowed back, to stand even briefly in the heart of what was. Thanks. Wow. Thank you. That is uh, beautiful. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to share one short excerpt of a piece. I actually realized now it was one, I think the first thing I've ever published. When I was a medical student, um, we were paired up with these fourth year medical students who seemed so old and experienced. And to give us an idea of clinical medicine, we were taken to the chief medical examiner of the city of New York on the corner of 30th and 1st Avenue and given a tour. And the tour began on the fifth floor with what they call the museum or the evidence room, which is historical evidence of all kinds of just crazy things that have come through the ME's office in New York City. Um, you know, there was a, a, a bone crusher that some wild murderer in the 1920s used in the bathtub in which he drowned his victims. There was even, and I remember this so clearly, a can of potatoes um, from the um, from the grocery store and a worker's finger had been severed and it, we turned up in a can of potatoes at some customer and they had both of these items together. All just, you know, it was right out of, out of a thriller noir novel. And so that kind of like, you know, freaked us all out. But then we went to the basement, to the autopsy room, and you go way down and it's freezing in there. And, and first they showed us the refrigerated area where, the, where either the unclaimed bodies are or people have been autopsied. Um, and it was all very overwhelming. And then the last place they took us was to the autopsy room itself, 
which was a, this long, cold room with seven or eight tables. And, uh, you know, each table had a body and, and there was a group of doctors um, around them. And it was it was very gory. I have to say, and I was, uh, you know, I was a week into medical school and I was feeling a little bit queasy. And then this is the uh, where the excerpt starts. Then I spied the last table, the only one without a sea of activity around it. Lying on the metal table was a young boy who didn't look older than 12. He was wearing new Nikes and one leg of his jeans was rolled up to the knee. His bright red basketball jersey was pushed up, revealing a smooth brown chest. He, he looked as if he were sleeping. I tiptoed closer. Could he really be dead? There was not a mark on his body. Every part was in his place. His clothes were crisp and clean. There was no blood, no dirt, no sign of struggle. He wasn't anything like the gutted carcasses on the other tables. His expression, it was serene. His face without blemish, his skin was plump. He was just, he was just a beautiful boy sleeping. And I wanted to rouse him, tell him to get out of this house of death quick before the rubber apron doctors get to you. There's still time, I wanted to say, get out while you can. I leaned over his slender, exposed adolescent chest. I peered closer. And there, just over his left nipple, was a barely perceptible hole, smaller than the tip of my little finger, a tiny bullet hole. I stared at that hole, that ignominious hole, that hole that, that stole this boy's life. I wanted to rewind the tape to give him a chance to dodge six inches to the right. That's all he'd need, just six inches. Who would balk over six inches? But then someone pulled on my arm. Time to go. For months after my visit to the medical examiner's office, I had nightmares. But they weren't about bloody autopsies or refrigerated corpses. I dreamt only about the boy, that beautiful, untouched, intact boy, the one who'd had the misfortune to fall asleep in the autopsy room. At night, he would creep into my bed. On the street, I could feel his breath on the back of my neck. In the library, while I battled the Krebs cycle and the branches of the trigeminal nerve, he would slip silently into the pages of my book. His body was so perfect, so untouched, except for that barely perceptible whole. Thank you all for sharing. Um, and Ab, I wanted to ask you um, to talk a little bit about the role of either experiencing art when one is a patient versus creating that art, like what people read or look at or listen to and what they actually make. That is a good question. Let me think about that. Um, I think that being the subject in illness has always been like basically bringing that to my writing has has been fraught and has been very interesting and, and being public about what is very private will always make you feel uncomfortable and I'm saying you just because I'm distancing myself but basically I think that in speaking about illness and in speaking about um, how it appears in my writing specifically and how I think of it as part, not therapy, but as part of how I order and organize my emotions for therapy and, and how the act of writing is about process, is, is always about process. I mean, words get to the idea of a feeling, but aren't the feeling, if I'm gonna be very esoteric about it. And there's such a, good feeling when you feel like you get the emotion right with the words. Um, and thinking about that very short poem I wrote, that poem was much, much longer. It was much more, it, it was still angry, but it was much more verbose. But the way in which I could get it crystallized down to an image and how that works with my writing and, and how that works with conveying a self that is damaged and feels damaged and feels um, you know, 
less than and how writing can make beauty out of that and how writing can make something that is particular universal. I don't think that my experience of breast cancer is the only experience of breast cancer, obviously, but how I interpret and how I write about it is very specific. And I think that when it comes to my writing and how writing about illness has changed my writing, um, I'm more delicate now. Um, it, it's more precious now, if that makes sense. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I think I think so. And and, and Samuel, I, I wanted to tap you in here because you you hinted on that when when a lot of students are writing, you know, the line between what is therapy, what is therapeutic, and and what is writing. Um, how do you negotiate that? You know, it, it's really very delicate because when I was a journalist, I was not supposed to be a part of the story. So my training in journalism is you are things are removed, those are sources, and so the chance to write essentially essays was to put myself out there, right? And so st these students come to class and it, I tell people what happens in class stays in class. You know, this is a sacred space. You know, we're here to talk about the writing. And I tell them, you know, if you want to get therapy, please get therapy, but this can be therapeutic. You can discover things about yourself. You can have epiphanies. You can discover, you can have clarity. Uh, you can remove shame, but it, it is different from therapy. I'm, so I'm always very clear, but it's a delicate thing because a lot of people, you know, I mean, there is a healing process that happens in, in writing. I mean, things are released and removed, but as a teacher, I have to keep telling them, you know, this is therapeutic. That it, that the, because I, I'm grading the, the product and not their process, you know? And so that process is between them and what's on, on the page, you know? Yeah, it's a very delicate thing. Um, yeah, and, and Sharon, I mean, you're a social worker, so you, you are, are taking care of patients. Do you find a role of art in, in that care, in your direction of one-on-one -on -one care? Um, well, I, I think for me, it's mostly come from doing the group. Um, and, and that's been a, a wonderful thing to be able to do and I also have to walk that line of it's it's therapeutic, but it's not therapy, and be very um, clear about that and how I how I do the group. Um, the, the the patients are already around so much. Uh, uh, this medical environment, um, this really sort of gives a, a a break from that to the extent that they actually told me at some point we don't want to call it a group, we're calling it a class. Um, and clearly emotions come out, they're writing about their lives and I can hold that space for them, but we don't you know, open it up in the group. So it's just really left with this expression, this validation, and they get to see themselves doing something normal um, that they might've done in their outside lives before coming to the hospital. And, and that in itself becomes very therapeutic. Um, so I think a large part of, of the job is to sort of be the social worker and the poet, you know, attending to their feelings, but not, making it poetry therapy. I've been very careful about not having it be poetry therapy, um, honoring the therapeutic part of it, but just really letting it be a creative class for them. Yeah, you know, one of the poets I admire a lot is Rafael Campo. Mm -hmm. And he is a doctor uh, up in Boston, who's a, a very well-known poet um, and has been affiliated with BLR for, for many years. In fact, he was at our very first reading 20 years ago at Bellevue. Um, and he always gives out poems to his patients. And he's got a collection of poems for diabetes and poems for hypertension. Um, and I've always admired that and envied that. Um, he, he's bilingual, and so he's able to share poetry in, in Spanish and English. And, and for me, um, you know, I, I don't have a lot of language concordance with my patients. I mean, my, my Spanish is only medical level, not, not literary level. And so I've never had the opportunity to, to share literature, but I, I realized at one point that there's one subgroup of, of Bellevue patients who tend to speak English, and that is the alcoholics. Um, and uh, as, as a class, many of them do. And so I, um, there's a wonderful poem by Jack Coulihan, another poet physician called, uh, called, I'm going to slap those doctors, or I'm going to slap those doctors. And it's perspective of an alcoholic who's so sick of those arrogant doctors with their white coats and their crossed arms. And I, so I carried it in my pocket all month until we had just the right English speaking alcohol uh, patient uh, come in. And so we got to the bedside with the team and I'd never done this. And it was, I have to say it was very nerve wracking, but I said, hey, 
would you mind if we just read a poem for a few minutes? And I have to say my team was very, a little uncomfortable, but I passed out the poem before anyone could, could stop me and we read it. And the patient loved it. He was like, that's it. That guy has got it. It's totally it. And, and I remember the, the weirdness in the room because, you know, we were, the sort of ground was shifting, you know, suddenly he was kind of the expert on what this poet was saying, you know, more than the team of doctors and, and medical students. And, and I have to say it changed some of the resentment. And I think many of us on medical teams are resentful of patients with, with addictions and substance use because it feels, you know, oh, they're just doing it and they're making our life difficult. And it's hard to sometimes separate out your personal resentments with your compassion, especially the people who are, you know, recurrent customers who, who come a lot. And I have to say that it changed the dynamic. And I think that we saw him differently. Didn't We didn't cure his addiction with, with, with that, but it did drop some of the like resentment feeling that I think we had between us. And um, I've always had this fantasy of, of doing it more, but I'm still waiting for that, that, uh, that opportunity. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm interested in what, um, if, if any of you want to comment, um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with, with you again, um, are there poets and writers who you look to when you're thinking about grappling with these issues, people you read or, or artists that you turn to who have maybe kind of paved the road a little bit before us? I mean, in terms of illness, in terms of writing about the body, I mean, I, I go to Lucille Clifton um, a lot. Um, just the ways in which she writes about her experience in her body as a black woman and, and all that. So she's definitely someone I go to. Um, but in terms of healing and writing, another resource, I'm gonna say resource, but another um, journal, I'll say that I, I, I turn to is wildfirecommunity.org. It's um, a breast cancer journal for women on the age of 40. So basically you don't expect to be diagnosed with breast cancer before 40. Not that anyone expects to be diagnosed with breast cancer, but that subgroup wanted a voice. And I and that particular journal is something I reach for um, and is been paving way for me to be more open about my experiences. So that's been pretty great. But I'm wondering, Sam, are you were going to say something? Yeah, be, because I work at a university and most of the people in my creative writing classes are young women, the subject of sexual assault comes up a lot. And so when Roxane Gay's book, Hunger, Memoir of My Body came out, and if you've read this book, at the center of the book is a sexual assault story. But it it, it kind of locates in her body and it's about, it's about eating, and this, I just found that the students absolutely love this book. Some of the chapters are one paragraph or one sentence. She uses journalism. She's critiquing cultures, of, uh, culture about the body. And then she's weaving in and out of, the, she's going back in time to tell us this sexual assault. It's just, it's sort of a postmodern take on something really difficult. And I just, every time I teach it, the students are just blown away by it. So it's a book that I go back to time and again. Uh, another woman I teach, her name is Elisa Washuta. Uh, she has a book called My, oh, I can't think of the name of it now, but she's Native American. And it's it's a it's an experimental memoir. So one chapter, she, it, she uses TV format. She uses episodes of Law and Order Special Victims Unit. Uh, she uses interviews with her own therapist. She had been a person who had had a drinking problem. And I, I taught it in experimental class because every chapter is so different, the students just ate it up. And so I think that if they can find something that has an entry point for them, uh, there is a certain amount of perspective shifting that can happen. I, mean, I, I, think, of, I think of writing as sort of alchemy. It's like, I'm, I'm, I wanna take something that's been really ugly and beautify it and, and give it back to the readers. And so it, is that healing, it's release for me and, and, and it's a doorway for people because my sister has mental illness. Uh, it was always a, a subject I never really talked much about. But when I found the TV window to talk about it, that, she, that my sister's obsessed with the Brady Bunch. Well, people know the Brady Bunch and they love Marsha, right? So I found a way to sort of get it out there and then get back to TV 
So yeah, so uh, you know, and I, I I'm obsessed with poetry also. I absolutely love Tracy K. Smith. I, I just find I, you know I'm, I'm I'm struck that there are two poets on this. So I, I think there's a way that poets are sort of literary magicians. And when I read poetry, I think, how do they do that? I can't do that. It's like magic. Uh, so I find that my students, I teach a lot of poets, and so students are able to say the unsayable in a poem, where it may be harder in prose. You can sort of, there are no rules in poetry. Uh, Sharon, I'll let you jump in right after that. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Rafael Campo. Uh, him and Bell Waring were, I think, my first uh, experiences of people writing about uh, their lives as medical professionals. And I was pretty blown away um, to know that people could do that and not just have it sound like a diary entry, but really uh, craft it into a poem, which, which just uh, amazed me. Um, so they've been very big influences for me. Um, and then Marie Howe, you know, um, the What the Living Do has, has been a favorite book of mine for, for years. Um, and then when my brother got ill, I, I went to it again and again, um, kind of for solace, but also once I started writing poems about him, like, like Samuel was saying, like, how, how did she do it? How did she um, turn this into this compelling poem that seems universal? So there was something about writing, even though you're in this intense experience, the, the actual writing and then kind of revising it, maybe showing it to people, gives you a little bit of distance um, which I think was good. And then looking at other authors to figure out, well, how did you craft it to lift it and to elevate it into something that could be put out into the world? Um, so it was very, very helpful to, to, to read. Um, I just want to tell you one other book I, I came across recently, Donna Messini, wrote 430 movie. Um, I had heard her at a reading and here was this book she wrote um, largely about her sister's illness and death. And she writes poems in these, these forms, kind of made up forms, a little bit like Terence Hayes. Um, it, just absolutely beautiful book. And again, it just really, um, I, I look to it to like, how, how do you enter? How do you enter that subject sometimes? And sometimes using a form to sort of get away from the emotional intensity sometime and, and shift your brain. Um, that, that inspired me too. It's almost, it sounds odd, but um, made it a little more playful at times working with, working with language. You know, I mentioned that Rafael Campo also writes prose, and I read his book, The Desire to Heal, when I was a medical student and was quite blown away uh, right from the first sentence, uh, quite, quite uh, grabs you. Um, and the other prose writer I would mention is Abraham Verghese. Um, both Abraham and Rafael have been on BLR's advisory board since the beginning. And I remember when I read Abraham Verghese's book, My Own Country. Um, and he writes about, uh, you know, emigrating from India to the U.S. and um, as an infectious disease doctor during the HIV, uh, you know, crisis of the 80s, 90s, and ending up with a job in small town Appalachia. And which is really, most people who came from international programs really was harder to get jobs in, in, the, in the big prestigious centers. And so he, a lot of these small towns were populated by Indian and Pakistani doctors. And what so captured me is how he deftly with nonfiction prose um, was able to tie in the metaphors of the illness. And so for these small, poor white communities dealing with this very dark disease, also with these very dark physicians who were you know, alien culturally, who were generally more educated and more affluent than, than they were, and how these things overlapped in such a powerful way. And he even used the language that, that local people use for different symptoms. That was all, all, all metaphorical. And, um, but then I'll also give a pitch for fiction, you know, which we always often call the great lie that tells the truth. Um, sometimes fictionalizing things is a way to, to approach it. And, and in fact, Abraham Verghese wrote a wonderful book called Cutting for Stone, which became a bestseller. And I remember being, so, uh, waiting a bit to read it because I, I've always been worried when my favorite nonfiction writers turn to fiction then I get disappointed. But it was fantastic and it was 570 plus pages and it really, you know, and, it, and illness was woven in the whole way as well as history and Ethiopia and the wars and um, culture. But it was a way to look at illness that, you know, when you're in the fictional mode, you have a little more freedom than in nonfiction. And, and um, 
it's very very powerful um uh, but i just want to ask you if, if you brought up audrey lord yet because she's someone um uh i think has influenced many of us i had not brought her up yet um her journals the her cancer journals um which was just re-released um really offered me like she's known for you know so much and reading her not during my experience with cancer but like three years later and seeing the perspective i got of her dealing with it imminently um she her ability to be so frank and so tender about um her frailty um was really an inspiration for me especially in terms of the language we use around um cancer and breast cancer patients like they are warriors and they are you know and going into battle and how for me personally that didn't work um and so reading her her experiences felt like kin um it's the like cancer is a club you never want to join obviously and here is this other person who's joined the club who i who i'm joining the club with who has helped me along in my experience um it's and for me the experience of writing about cancer was kind of counter to the bright pink and toxic positivity of it i i wasn't you know a cheerful warrior every day i was i was angry and i was you know scared and i was i was I was stunned and shocked, obviously, and being able to read another person's experience that felt close to my own was really was really powerful. Um, I'm glad I didn't read her while I was in treatment because that would have been too much. But um, but Audrey Lord was a really good you know person to turn to. Um, but a question I have, which I was thinking about when I was thinking about this panel and coming to it, was basically as artists, as facilitators, when you with your workshops. Um, how do you toe the line between writing and, you know, helping your students write and towing that line between like writing as curative versus being corrosive, being self-indulgent, being self-pitying and catastrophizing? Um, like how complicated is that, is that line to toe when, when dealing with, you know, Alzheimer's and dealing with sexual assault and dealing with, you know, trauma that definitely needs therapy obviously um but you want to help your students grow i'm happy to jump on that one because one of my biggest fears about nonfiction and writing personal essays was the inherent narcissism that people think comes with it and so one way that i the best writers nonfiction people i find dance i call it letting the micro and the macro dance. So I'm letting my story dance with a larger cultural issue. And so what I find is when students want to just go into something about them and their lives and other families, and I say, wait, 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 who else cares? What's the larger cultural conversation point? You have to give me something to hook onto. And so for me, I, I realized that as I've been writing these essays for years, TV kept coming up. I'm like, why is Dallas and Dynasty in this? What is, where is this coming from, right? So I realized that was my way of inviting people into a working class Black family because people know about TV. So what I think is going to evolve into a whole memoir is, so I'll use our story and we'll dance against whatever that, so for some people it may be movies or it may be whatever the research says, but I always tell my students, nobody cares about your family alone you've got to give us something else to connect it to and so if you can through research or some cultural context open it up you're inviting people in so i think that's the key in nonfiction, anyway i agree with you, you know we we get it at blr we get about four thousand submissions a year and since we publish only about 70 we have to reject a lot of pieces and a lot of many good pieces but particularly painful is rejecting nonfiction because people are writing about their most emotional moment or their illness, their family member's illness. And, and I try to explain to students that there's a you know, difference between um, a moving experience and a moving piece of writing. And that all of these experiences are very moving, but it doesn't necessarily, just to write it down doesn't make it moving writing. And, and it's a painful thing to, to say. And the pieces that, that do make it to BLR, often they work because of, of exactly what you've said. There's something intertwined with it. 
that that gives it um i mean what what makes something literary it's that it's transcendent that it transcends the story the mere quote unquote the mere story being told there's something that rises it rises above somehow and particularly with nonfiction, it's very easy to get caught in sort of the leaden weight of okay here's what happened when i got diagnosed and this is what happened in treatment this is what happened later um and uh you know it's not captivating if you're not that person or, or that family and so that's a really i think a wonderful uh piece of advice for nonfiction folks um sharon what do you think um well in the in the group i have it's really focused on the process um and the people who come are are the people who are at a higher intellectual level so they can all take a writing topic to run with it spend 20 minutes writing and then we read so I, i've had to focus it on a very like positive note we don't do a lot of um critiquing the actual poem and the parts of the poem we will listen to each other's work and maybe comment on the experience of whatever was written about um, and, and that's what's been kind of benefit beneficial for this particular um, population. And they, I, I, I've tried to give them all sorts of different, um, you know, writing strategies and writing ideas, talking about the tenets of, of poetry. Um, so for them, it's it's really about telling telling stories. Um, and then I, I try to give that some shape, <laughs> some structure. Uh, so it's a little more poetic, but it's really about getting their stories out and their voice out so they can be seen and heard um, away from their diagnosis, away from the medicalization that can happen um, when someone's living in a nursing home. You know, someone asked a question in, in the Q&A about, uh, is there any scientific evidence, empirical data to support the use of art, you know, in healing, or is it just all, all anecdotal? Um, and it's a topic that intrigues me for sure. Um, and there is some data, but it's pretty small, partly because these are very difficult studies to um, to do. In order to show an effect, it, it can be very hard to do. But there are some things. For example, there was a study, um, and I believe it was rheumatoid arthritis, that randomized patients to writing and not writing. And those who did writing you know, had lower pain scores in the end. You know, who knows what, and, you know, who knows what that was tied to, but uh, it's certainly interesting if, if there's a way to process some of your pain uh, in the writing. And the other study I would cite is studies with medical students. Um, there are many medical schools that do programs with art museums in their local cities, where docents from the museum take groups of medical students and, and really work with them and train them on, on careful examination and examining art in a detailed way to go beneath a superficial you know, first view of what you see, and that these students then ultimately score higher on, on scales of empathy. Again, you know, does it make them, do their patients have better stroke outcomes? You know, we, it's simply not possible to, to conduct a, a study of that scale, but we certainly hope so. And, and I, you know, all these students, I mean, the, I mean, people do a lot of research on medical students, and, and sometimes that it feels itself self-indulgent, but th those kids, they're going to be our doctors, so it does pay for us to care what what happens to them and how we train them, and and certainly you know we want them to have all the scientific knowledge, but I think if we can, in addition, you know, help them with these other skills, and and, and the one skill that that I feel um, is important is is the skill of metaphor, and you know a lot of medical journals publish poetry, which seems crazy on a lot of levels. You know, why would a medical journal publish poetry? Plus, a poem published in JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine, that's one fewer page of advertising. You know, a, a one ad in you know, one of these journals costs fifteen dollars or $20,000. So think of the AMA voluntarily declining an ad for Viagra to publish a poem. It's pretty radical. Um, but I think that the, the poems, um, certainly for the readership, many, many physicians I know will say they always turn first to the poem or, or the essay before they see which randomized trial, you know, has shattered another standard of care. Because I think that the poetry and, and the and the short um, nonfiction fiction that's published often speaks more to how we live our lives, you know, in the day-to-day -day world of caregiving than these, you know, big mega trials, even if they're incredibly clinically relevant, statistically significant. But I think that the skill of metaphor in particular is important because I, I see that patients speak to us in metaphor all the time. I mean, patients come in, they don't say, you know, I've got vasculitis, right? They say, oh, I don't feel good, right? That's their metaphor. That could mean one of a million things, or, or they have pains in 300 different spots, and and it's our job 
to interpret the metaphor. You know, one person's chest pain is a, you know, is a heart attack and one person's chest pain is depression. One person's chest pain is longing for their homeland. It's many different things and it's our, our job to unpack that metaphor. And, and of course, interpreting metaphors is a skill. And we practice that with, with, with poetry. And I think if we don't focus on the patient's metaphor um, and what they really mean and just focus on the uh, superficial you know, uh, content, we'll miss the many layers of meaning. We'll also miss the diagnosis. We will make medical errors and our patients will dump us for doctors with a more sophisticated understanding. And I think part of the doctor shopping we often see is patients tell their story in the way that they tell it, which may contain metaphors of some varying level of complexity. And some doctors and nurses take the time to try and figure it out and some don't. And the ones who don't, I think that that's why patients often leave. Um, I'd be interested, um, uh, Abba, you, you've been a patient. What's been your experience of the way that your medical teams vary in their listening, understanding ability, and, and can you tie that all into your thinking about art? That's an interesting question. Um, my medical team, depending upon the specialty, <laughs> was either incredibly thorough in, you know, answering questions and going through the minutia of, you know, explaining what something, what was happening to body and why, and like what I could expect. Um, I love my surgeon, um, but maybe I prefer the, you know, internist who, you know, helps me go through like, okay, this is what you could do, you know, <laughs> right? Um, um, my experience as a patient, because I also have asthma and I've also, you know, chronic illness is something that I'm, I'm very familiar with, unfortunately. Um, the doctors who listen, um, who really listen, um, are people that you hold on to, obviously, as we just discussed. But um, in thinking about how being most vulnerable, being the person in the room who's most vulnerable and having to explain you know, something that is wrong with your body over and over and having that be met with grace. Um, those are the doctors who become almost like family, like friends, because you are having a conversation of a certain level of intimacy and, and being met halfway, right? Where the humanity is being explored even with two different levels of expertise in health and in, in, and in the body. Um, and I think that where, I think where being a patient um, allowed me to meet my doctors with like grace as well. Like they are also human and they're also, you know, dealing with this particular, you know, illness on a daily basis with multiple people, not just me. And, and, and having that kind of like empathy go both ways um, is really special. And I think that um, in my experiences, the, the doctors who made me feel like I'd have a conscious and made me feel safe and made me feel like I, my care was being taken care of um, to a level that um, is why I'm here. So certainly, right? Um, but... Yes, I'll ask, actually ask Samuel, because in, in your essay and obviously in the experience, you've been through a long, your family's been through a long journey with your mm -hmm. sister's illness. And I, I wonder what you may have learned along the way, at, you know, from being in different medical situations and what you think about the their ability to perceive the metaphors that your sister, you know, experienced her illness in. Wow. So at one, so in this very violent beginning where I, I talk about my sister's attack on my mother. Um, so my sister is now in a, in, in the facility for the mentally ill and she developed something called, I think they call it midnight madness where she writes all these things down. So my mother would go visit her and she would have stacks and stacks of papers of things that she had just been writing. So my mother knows everything happening in that facility because my sister's writing it all down, which I think is really, really kind of powerful. Uh, and that event happened like 30, almost 40 years ago now. And my sister's still writing down when Anthony grabbed me by the hair, right? So it's like, wow. So there's something about, the, about writing that allows people to release, I think, in a way that we don't fully understand, you know? 
um, yeah, so I, I think I, I may have meandered from your question, Danielle, but. Um, I, I think so. And actually, I was just thinking when you say the unconscious, you know, often writing teachers, and I don't know if Sharon, if you've done this, is have your students or group do free writing to, to simply write without stopping um, for X minutes and not pick up your pen and just keep it going, even when you think you're blocked, just to keep writing to see, you know, what, what flows out. Um, uh, de definitely do that. And I, I, I do that with myself <laughs> um, as a way to, to sort of jumpstart a process. It's very hard to have the real intense emotions and sit down and say, I want to write a poem. Um, but to, to give yourself that freedom to write whatever is, is in there, right? Whatever is coming out. And I, I think that's just incredibly instrumental because somewhere in there, there's going to be something that surprises you or something you're going to go back to, um, or you're going to, that metaphor is going to be revealed to you. Um, it, every time, um, just the right image has come to me for a poem, it, it just comes. But that's because you've been writing and writing and writing, and then it sort of lifts out from the unconscious or that place in you that's kind of mysterious. Um, and that metaphor kind of tells me sometimes what, what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling. And it's somehow so soothing. And it is kind of healing to, oh, that's, that's the way to say it. That's how I feel. So I think there's incredible power in not editing yourself. And it's really hard to do, but just put the pen down, set the timer and just keep going. Even if it's just babble, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say, <laughs> whatever well, the words uh, are. Let's ask you and then also Abbas, how do you as poets decide what form you want the poem to be in? Do some forms are free form, some are villanelle, right. some are sonnets, some are rhyming couplets. Do you decide that in advance? Do you simply write and see what fits most? Do you have a, a, a method to the madness? No, <laughs> um, I, it just all it looks like a block to me when it first comes out uh, or sometimes I'm like, oh, I'll just do a couplet. In the end, I try to let the poem tell me um, the best I can, what shape, and, and sometimes that will happen. Oh, no, no, this has to be in the shorter line because maybe the, the emotion felt more compressed or maybe I need to <gasps> let it open up. Um, the one I read about the inside the Alzheimer's unit started out as couplets. And, you know, I liked it well enough. And then in my writing group, they had this uh, prompt one day that said, uh, you know, collect a bunch of words, you know, verbs and nouns, and then throw them into a poem you like, but that isn't quite working. And I did. And it completely changed the poem. And all of a sudden, I can't see that poem, but it's written in, you know, a little phrase, and then there's a white space, and then there's a phrase, and there's a white space. And that ended up matching the, the emotion of the poem, that kind of stopping and starting that, that happens with somebody with dementia, with dementia and when you're trying to talk to them. Um, I don't know that I could have just thought of that consciously and said, oh, that's a good match, I'll try that. But it was, again, just in that writing process, um, experimenting, going back to an old poem, revising, and it, and it kind of unfolded. So I think it's just that willingness to not know with your poem and you know, do your best to um, listen to the poem the best you can. Abba, how about you? No, I agree with, with Sharon. Basically, I don't, I don't enter into a poem with the form in mind. Um, it's more about the sounds. It's more about the intonation and the thoughts and, like, and grouping them together in ways that produce the most powerful image or the most powerful feeling. Um, there's a, I mean, I tend towards um, more abstract poem, you see the format of the poems in, in BLR show that I'm, I'm not incredibly narrative and very like, prose poems. It's very much like thoughts, verbs, and truncated lines. Um, and that very much in those two poems reflects like the either contemplative or, you know, frustrated feeling of the poems. Like, um, so I think for, for myself, the poem has been edited like three times for me before it even gets on the page. Like I've, I've been thinking the thoughts, I've been like, I have the images, I have the feeling, and then, you know, when I finally get to the page, and I also handwrite my poem, my first draft. So I'm not even typing, I'm handwriting my first draft. And so that also, you know, really affects how the poem comes out. And then I'm like, oh, right, well then if I do this and you can scratch out and, and very much with free writing, like and editing with like with your with your pen, um, I find that 
changes a poem before I even take it to my word processor where it gets edited again. And then the form becomes whatever word allows me to do with my punctuation, with my spacing, so. You know, and I'll, I'll put in a pitch that there's as just as many, or maybe not quite as many, but considerations of form in, in prose and in, in, even in nonfiction, which is mainly what I write. And I worked on a piece um, of my first book where I was telling the story of, uh, as a third year resident, I had a very difficult experience of a patient who needed to be intubated and was um, fighting the intubation. It was a young man uh, who had attempted suicide by drinking lye. And, and so he had a, uh, a terrible esophageal tears and strictures and was readmitted multiple times. And he was admitted when I was the medical consult of the, the senior medical resident in charge. And it was a nightmare. It was a disastrous thing. And it was a terrible outcome. And afterward, um, this case got called for uh, presentation at what's called M and M rounds, which is morbid morbidity and mortality rounds. That's when you present things that have gone wrong. And as the resident charge, I had to be up there and present the case, and it was uh, a nightmare. Um, but when I wrote the the piece, I kind of wrote about what happened, and then I wrote about the experience of being in the M and M. And in fact, I still had my presentations, and then I kind of wrote that. And uh, it went sequentially. And then my husband, who is not a writer, but he said, why don't you braid those three different voices? And so I tore them up in a different way and sort of would give what happened and then could flip right to presenting it. And it, it made different things come out. So for example, the intubation, as I said, was a nightmare. And I remember the feeling as though I felt that I was raping this man. That's how it felt. I was forcing it down and, you know, pink puritone sputum is flying, he's fighting, and we had to force him down with me and one other surgery resident. Um, and then in the presentation, it was read, the patient was intubated with difficulty, period. And it um, made me realize that the way we speak about what happens in medicine is so different than how it actually occurs. And all of those hours of nightmare and sweat and blood and crying and screaming all got down to this very sterile line and that we would fold it all in there. And, and of course, never deal with all of the, the trauma for the patient, for the, the, the myself and the other young resident of, of doing this, all was evaporated, so kind of swept under. The patient was intubated with difficulty, period. Um, and, and Sam, I'm going to ask you if you think how you think about form when you're writing. Well, one of the best teaching experiences I had was a class called Queering Nonfiction. And the students were all excited about queer content, but I really was in, interested in experimentation, right? And so I had people write, so we, we read a bunch of books that were completely experimental, and it I think it changed people's lives. I think uh, the, the book I've mentioned earlier, somebody typed in the chat was Elisa Rashuda, My Body is a, is a Book of Rules. And in this book, she uses about seven or eight different forms and it, it made the memoir so cohesive. So, you know, I, I'm really interested in the relationship between the possibilities of poems and the possibility of prose, I think, you know, we, we think a lot, you know, I'm all, as a person who's teaching nonfiction, I hate that it's called non something. I wish it had this other, it's another title because non centers something else. But there are so, there's so much experimentation in hermit crab forms that people can play with that's actually as liberating as poetry. But I have to force people to, to think outside the box. And, and you're right. I mean, it's the, the, when I, at the beginning of each of my classes, I use, I have a, a, a list of prompts, for, a whole deck of prompts. And I have, and I, I give it to one of the students and there are like 20 prompts on it and they read one. And I say, okay, everybody write for five minutes. And very often that would become a poem that they submit to workshop, or that would become something that would be the beginning of an essay. Or So there's something about the freedom that we have to keep giving ourselves permission to have within the limitations of truth. I'm mean, gonna tell people, don't make shit up, but, that, but, you can, but the forms are really fluid within the limitations of, of what really happened. 
Um, we can borrow heavily from fiction, from format, as long as we stay within the truth. And I often tell my students to, you know, when we read great fiction, like if you read Atonement by Ian McEwan, it's a huge book, but if you actually map it out, he shrinks and expands time all the time. And there will be a, uh, a 10 second moment that lasts 50 pages and then a hundred years will be in a paragraph. And of course it feels completely natural because that's the way we experience things. But amateur writers will have on day one, on day two, and it will all be the same. And in nonfiction, you know, we can start before the event, after the event, we can flash back, we can flash forward. We could also always imagine, right? Nonfiction narrators can imagine, and you can be fictional in your imagination, but you do have to stick with the truth because we do call it nonfiction or essay if you want to avoid a, 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 a non. I wanted to show people, this is the very first issue of BLR from September of 2001. This is the cover, this is the one iteration of Bellevue Hospital. And I was going to share one poem, in fact it was this closing poem, and it's called Art, and it's by Eric uh, Nelson. October, a woman and a boy, a tumor overtaking his brain, draw pictures in the waiting room. She makes a red apple as round as a face. Then from her hand, a cloud grows and darkens over the apple until the crayon breaks inside its wrapper and hangs like a snapped neck from her bloodless fingertips. He's drawn two stick figures up to their necks in falling gold leaves, their heads all smiles. It's you and daddy, he tells her. Above them, a flock of M's fly toward a grinning sun. When she doesn't answer, he says, on Halloween, he'd like to be a horse with orange wings. Staring at his picture, she says, it looks like Thanksgiving, where are you? He taps the sun, I'm shining on you. She hugs him as if trying to press him back inside her. I'm not crying, she whispers. He looks over her shoulder, I'm not crying too. And that's the poem and that's the, uh, the form of the poem here. And I remember reading, you know, the first, the very first issue of BLR, everything was on paper. And the way we came up with the orders, we laid all the submissions out on a big long table and walked around and moved the poems around. And this one just captured me. And, and um, part of it is that it's so accessible and so simple and feels like a simple nothing story. It's just a kid drawing. Um, and, and then when he just makes that little, all you have to do is make that little twist. I'm not crying too. And then suddenly you, the reader, are, are crying. And, and I admire these sort of a, economy um, that poetry can use, as you said, Samuel, that sort of literary magic. And, and, and poetry allows us, I think, to dispense with the, you know, prosaic details of plot and character. You can just pick one tiny emotion. You can tease it out from everything else and then, you know, hold it up to the light and, and, and twist it around and you can catch all the nuances and all the warts in this tiny little drip. And, and to me, the, you know, a good poem, it's like you could go to those, you know, um, if you ever drive an I-95 or take a long road trip and you stop at um, those rest stops and they have those 595 all you can eat buffets that it's a lot of food, but it's not really good. Or you could have one like dark chocolate truffle and that little tiny bite will like burst in your mouth and overwhelm more than a huge, huge meal. And, and that's why I, I, I think poetry can be so, so powerful. Um, I, I just want to say, someone wrote in and asked if um, we could summarize all the writers we've brought up. We've mentioned a lot of people. And so we'll assemble a list um, of all the writers and books that we've brought up during this conversation. And um, we can either send it out through HBS. If not, um, I'll make it available on the BLR website. There's a contact and info and we'll happily send it to everyone. I think it's a great reading list. And um, I don't know if we mentioned Susan Sontag, Illness as Metaphor, but that would really be on that list. And I know, Abba, you talked about, you know, the battlefield metaphor of cancer that we use and, and people have to be survivors. And, and I, I uh, have a patient right now with breast cancer who is also very uncomfortable with this. She's not a survivor. She's, you know, an experience E in, in this and doesn't, uh, want that and, and often these, these labels and metaphors don't don't ring well and maybe we need to come up with some some new metaphors anyone got some um, 
I, I, um, I did want to ask uh, each of you kind of what's next? What is, what is uh, coming up? And I don't um, Abba, do you want to uh, talk first? What's, what are you looking at these days? Uh, I'm working on my first book and getting that manuscript all organized. Um, I have a couple of friends working on that with me in terms of getting it edited and pared down to its, you know, best self. So we'll is it some. a po poetry collection or a prose? So the first, the first draft, the first manuscript is poetry. And the second one is memoir based upon personal essays I wrote during treatment. Wow. And do you so. have a working title yet? The first one is um, Easy Never Happened. And the second one um, was Adventures in Cancer Land, but that's going to change. That's that's term. And I think that, that Adventures in Cancer Land has been used. I think David Sedaris. That's right. He did. Okay. It's already taken. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sharon, what, oh, Sharon, what are you working on? Um, so I've been trying to put a chapbook together of the poems I've written about my brother's illness and death. And it was one of those experiences where I thought I had it. <laughs> you know? And I was showing the, the whole manuscript to a few people I'm like, no, we need to know more and more about him. Um, so one of the poems in there is this dialogue. Um, imagine, completely imagine um, dialogue between him and myself. And in, in this form, that's just him and then the lines and then me and then the lines. Um, and that is some, somewhat compelling. So I'm thinking maybe to go back in that vein and put a few more of those in there to reveal more about who he is and see if I can flesh out the manuscript a little bit more. So fingers crossed. All right. Samuel, what are you working on? Yes. So as Daniel knows, a, a literary agent re approached me about this essay about my sister and told me that he thought I had a whole manuscript. So I've been working on the manuscript for a long time, but it feels like I like this title of Our Eyes Were Watching Marsha because it harkens back to the Zora Neale Hurston, right? So it's completely Black in conversation with white TV, right? And so I'm trying to marry that. And so it's 15 years, it starts with Ike and Tina Turner on the um, Ed Sullivan show in 1970, when my parents are together and I'm, I'm, the marriage is whole. And at the end, by 1985, it ends with me and my mother sitting down watching Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? And my sister's been put away. And so I'm using TV as a personal history and I talk about Good Times, it is all the shows that we love, but it's a way to kind of talk about some difficult things through TV. And I'm giving cultural history and critique of who's represented on TV and who's not. And it's made a lot more fun. And I, th I think the I think the book um, I love to watch from the, the New Yorker woman, um, Emily Nussbaum, kind of removes the shame of like watching TV. So I think she won a Pulitzer for this book. I'm like, okay, I can come out of the, out of the closet as a TV lover. So that, that's what I'm working on. So I'm taking 10 years of personal essays and I really I look back and think, you know, there's a lot of TV here. There's TV here, there's TV here. So I'm putting I'm pulling it all together for a book proposal. I will give a shout out to Emily Nussbaum, who is a fantastic TV reviewer for The New Yorker. And I even if I don't watch the shows, I love reading her work because she she makes them larger than life. So I recommend that. I also confess that as a kid, I watched those reruns of The Brady Bunch and Marsha was my favorite character. <laughs> too, uh, you know, couldn't be more white bread than compared to my upbringing. And yet there's something that was just this unattainable, uh, um, you know, uh, unattainable thing that, that somehow I just, we all wanted, we all wanted Marsha. Uh, um, I'll say for me, what I'm working on now is um, uh, right now I'm working on an article on, on transparency in the medical record and what happens when patients now read their own medical records. How does that change our, our dynamics? And then, of course, my big project is now working, you know, on, on BLR. And many of you uh, may know BLR. When we started, we were part of NYU, um, as part of their division of medical humanities, but we had to leave during the pandemic. And so BLR really kind of got reborn in, in uh, the summer of the spring and summer of 2020, from being a university-based magazine to being a a, um, a nonprofit, its own literary arts organization. And so one of the exciting things is that. We feel like we're growing from being not just a literary journal, but now a literary arts organization. And so we're looking for ways to bring the literary arts to the public in as many creative ways as, as possible. And so uh, and collaborating with other art forms. So one of our, our um, things that we most enjoyed doing last year, we did a collaboration with the Paige Fraser Foundation um, uh, uh, and we did a sort of poetry, dance and disability 
format where we picked four BLR poems about disability and gave them to two, four uh, dancers with disability. And this focus was on artists of color and they choreographed their own work. And then we made a professional film with uh, Salim Hugh Penny, um, who is now also an assistant poetry editor, but then was our winner of our poetry prize, read the poems, we had one of our, our editorial assistants make these beautiful visual renderings of the poems and a sign language interpreter and then commissioned music and then made a, a like a 13 minute film short of, of um, it was called Reading the Body. And it's actually been accepted to four film festivals. So now we're actually gonna have an annual poetry and dance a, a event that we're very excited about. But there's all kinds of ways that you can bring the literary arts um, we've done some collaborations with Film Forum for independent films that that connect to this, and um, it it feels really exciting. You know, it's a it's a sort of a new chapter of of BLR really sort of stepping out on, onto the larger stage. And so, I certainly invite all of you who are listening, please do uh, check out our website. It's blreview.org, and all the subscriptions do have twenty percent off twenty four twenty f o r. Um, also, all the events are there. And you can see we did a, an event on um, on writing confronts racism and an uh, event on COVID uh, writing goes viral. And we have upcoming events. We will have an event on March 23rd, kind of commemorating the second anniversary of COVID and looking at the writing from there. Um, so we're, we're very uh, excited. And I thank you all. And thank you, Samuel and Sharon and my co-editor, Ava. And um, Thank you to the audience, um, and it looks like we'll be able to send out all of our favorite writers to you, so uh, hang tight for that email, and John, I will pass it back to you. Thank you very much, Danielle, and thank you, Abba, and Samuel, and Sharon. You have done a wonderful job tonight telling people how art and the creative process can really assist in people regaining their health, dealing with health issues. Uh, I'm very happy that we were able to present this to our art expert symposia attendees tonight. And I'm going to re reiterate what uh, Danielle said. It's blreview.org. It is their 20th anniversary. 2420 is a subscription discount. And while you're there at the website, make a donation. If you are in the arts world, if you're in the creative world, help them out. You've just heard how they've gone from part of a group to their own standalone nonprofit status. Once again, from the point of view of a venture capitalist, that's an amazing thing you've made it so far and done so well. And any of us that can help support you, please do so. 